Good morning, everyone. Hope that you're okay today. Let's stand uh, together. My name is Tyler. Great to see you this morning. I want to welcome you, uh, all of you that are on Facebook and online. So glad that you're joining us. We're going to sing about God's love today. We're going to continue to talk about it in 1 John. So let's, uh, let's stand together. Let's join in. Let's sing. song we introduced to you last week. Before I call, before I ever cry, you answer me from where the thunder hides. I cannot run this heart I'm tethered to. With every step, I collide with you. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never 
believe that today. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy day, my anchor holds within the hell. Oh, and Jesus now. As we uh, just continue to sing about his love, it's just amazing that, that he's rescued us. I want you to know there's life in him today. And let's remember that he set us apart and given us his spirit to do great things in his kingdom. So let's just join in and celebrate that. Back to a first love, nothing between us. Back to your heart, to the start of it all. Where we found you And out of the ashes And into the fire You were refining our hearts In the flames of your presence Set apart for a God above Set apart
for who he is, not just what he's done. Let's pray. God, we have gathered here this morning from all over this area and from all different walks of life with good weeks and bad weeks and anything in between. And God, collectively, we have sung to you declarations of hope and trust. And so God, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would allow us to just know these truths, not just as we know facts, but God, we would know these truths that you are our cornerstone, that you, your love never fails, that your love is fierce, not just in general, but God, personally. God, would you by your Holy Spirit do the work that instruments and preaching can't? And so God, we just, run to you as a gathered group of believers over three venues on two campuses saying that you are enough. God, we love you. Jesus, it's in your name that we pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Uh, welcome. Uh, glad you guys are here at all of our venues. Hey, North, how are you guys doing? Um, our ushers at all of our venues are going to make their way down. They're going to begin uh, taking our tithes and offerings. My name is Eric Clark. I'm one of the guys here on staff, and I want to make you guys aware of a couple of things that's happening around our uh, faith family. Uh, the first is uh, we gather in fairly big groups every Sunday, and it's easy just to exist but it's harder to connect and belong here at Stonegate. And we want to do whatever we can to take these big environments and help you transition into smaller ones where you can be known. And uh, one of the best ways that you can do that is by filling out one of these Start Here cards. They are in the seat back in front of you in this venue, uh, around your seat in all the other venues, and out in our info desk in our foyer. And what we want to do, because we believe that every single person gathered here has a next step with Jesus. And so we want you to fill out the front with your info and on the back, kind of give us some context about what you think your next step is. And we're going to take the baton and do our best to walk with you through that. 
Uh, the second thing really is an extension of the Start Here card. If you're an adult in any one of our gatherings, uh, we want to make that transition really easy. And we have several environments really that you can just show up. You don't have to sign up if you're an adult. Uh, we have a Wednesday morning men's Bible study that starts off at 6.30 uh, in the morning. We have a women's Bible study every Wednesday night. Uh, if you're a married couple and you want to see your marriage really uh, reignite or reconnect or maybe even it needs resurrection, we have this group called Reengage, this class that meets every Wednesday night. And if you're an 18 to 30-year-old, we started a new class last week during the 12 o'clock hour called Pursuit, and we'd love to invite you there. And those are the things that you can jump into without signing up. But then we have some other opportunities like Next Steps or, or we have a Renew uh, Women's Conference that are coming up. Or we have uh, men's boot camps or uh, work trips up to Gloriette where we do summer camp. Or, or we have a Love and War weekends. We have a plethora of things that we want you guys to connect with. We want to make it easy as possible um, for you as an adult to take your next step with Jesus. Um, the last thing I want to cover uh, really sometimes can be awkward or sometimes sensitive at church. I want to talk to you a little bit about money or, or why we give here at Stonegate. And we're not in a bad place financially. We're not trying to manipulate you or guilt you into giving. What we want to do is to help you understand the why we do this every week, the why we pass baskets, the why we have giving boxes in our walls. Ultimately, worship is not just singing songs like we just did. Worship is a whole life response to the transforming, limitless, agape love of Jesus Christ that you're going to hear a little bit more about today and hopefully every Sunday with us. And so what we want to do is to invite you in and welcome you in to this act of worship of giving and stewarding the fiscal resources because you believe in what God is doing in and through this broken, amazing cool place called Stonegate Fellowship into the ends of the earth. And so, yes, you can give through a variety of different re, uh, ways, through the baskets, or we have uh, boxes in the walls uh, at every exit in our venues. Uh, you can go out into the Midland Mains foyer and give. And like me and my family, we try to, uh, we do ours online because we, it's very convenient for us. And so, again, we're not trying, um, uh, we're not in a bad place. We just want to invite you in as we give as a faith family in great response to the loving work of Jesus to the ends of the earth. And so um, love you guys so much. Thank you for uh, your attention. I'm going to turn it over to a good, good friend of mine, Jeff Turner, our Odessa campus minister. He's going to take us into week two of our new series, uh, A Letter from an Elder. Awesome. Thanks, El thanks Eric. I almost said thanks, Elder. Thank you, Eric. Well, hey, good morning. How are y'all today? Awesome. What's well, good to be with you? Like Eric said, my name is Jeff Turner, and I'm the campus minister at our uh, Odessa campus. So welcome north and Odessa. Good morning. Glad you're there, and I'd like to be with you, but I'm here. So um, anyways, glad we're going to have a good time this morning. Um, we got to get right to work this morning so that we can really get set up for really where we're going. So um, last week, if you weren't here, Patrick set up a new series for us called A Letter from an Elder, okay? And we started in um, a book that most of us usually don't spend a lot of time in, or, or start with at least, is the book of Revelation. And so when we got to the book of Revelation, we got to chapter 2, and we spent some time looking at um, this church that John references right off the top, this church of Ephesus, and as we read Revelation chapter 2, we, we got to looking at the reality that this church was doing everything right by their own accord, they, by, by the Lord's accord. They, they, were, they were teaching well, they were, they were shepherding, guarding, they were, they were doing what we would consider the work to be done by the, by the church. And then as we talked about last week, we got to this section, this part where it said, but this is what I have against you that you have left your first love, okay? And so that whole, um, and if you haven't listened to it or, or, or seen it, go back, rewatch it as we go into the series, but that whole phrase really was the lens by which we are, are tackling this subject of a letter from an elder and what the Lord is speaking to this church. And, and as importantly, what the Lord is speaking to us as a church, okay? So we started last week with this reality. There was a church that was doing everything right, but they left their first love. So over the next several weeks, we want to take some time to look at 
how we do things through this lens of love, okay? And so for the next three, so this one and the next two, um, we're going to be talking about a few things that are, are really critical in how we set up kind of the next three weeks of how to love well, okay? So the first three today, or the first three of the next couple of weeks are going to be how we tackle and look at love, abiding, and light, okay? We're going to see that in, 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 in the, what we're about to read here in a moment, but these three things are going to help shape us in how we talk about how to love others well. So if we start in Revelation chapter 2, the question then is, well, where do we go for that? Well, where do we go after that, before that? And so as we talked about last week, Patrick set up that when John was writing to this church in Ephesus in, in the 90s, um, 30 years prior to that possibly is when they were writing the book of Ephesians, the book of Acts, and so forth, in first, first and Second Timothy. And so, yeah, First, Second Timothy, Ephesians, the book of Acts, 30 years, and then we get to First, Second, and Third John, and then Revelation. And so, as we talked about last week, there seems to be this 30-year gap of leadership and what is being spoken into this church of what they're doing and how they're doing it. So naturally for us, we look at, okay, if there's a church and, and all of a sudden the Lord is telling John, hey, this church is doing well in these things, but here's what they have left, their first love. What is the last thing that he's writing to this church? And so the last thing that John is writing to this group of people comes from First and Second and Third John. So this is where we're going to be at this morning. So I invite you to go to 1 John, and I'm going to go to chapter 4 this morning. So go to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. So if you are using old school paper, it's, it's towards the back. It's, it's, um, it's right before you get to uh, Revelation, and, um, or just use your table of contents. There's no um, shame in that. If you're using your phone, you know, just... Click it. So, all right, First John chapter 4. And this morning what I want to do um, is I want to spend some time looking at quite possibly one of the most crucial passages in Scripture that has to do with talking about love. So if we were reading in Revelation chapter 2 that you have left your first love, and remember last week we heard from Patrick that, that word left your first love is essentially the same word that we get for the word divorced, okay? That there was an intentional, even if unintentional, they forsook, abandoned, and left the first love about who they were as a church. They were doing all the things right, but they left love. And, and Patrick even used this illustration of sometimes in our relationships or even marriage, how one, one of the other spouses may be doing everything right but miss loving the other person, okay? This church was doing that. So love has to be our lens. And if we're going to 1 John, no better passage than in chapter 4 to talk about love. In fact, in, the, in chapter 4 alone, the word love is used 27 times. That's a lot, okay? In fact, we're going to see that in a few passages that we're going to read. So go to 1 John chapter 4. Let's go to verse 7. Let's get right into it of talking about love this morning. I'm going to do like I did last week. I'm going to read a passage, talk about it, continue on, read a passage, and then so forth. So verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Okay, so let's stop there and let's talk a little bit about verse 7 just for a little bit. So what I love about this is it says, let us love one another for love is from God. Okay, it tells us to do something, but there is a reason why that's backing it up. Okay, that love is from God. For us to even continue talking about how to love one another, we have to begin to understand what this type of love is that John is speaking of. This type of love, okay, will shape and is critical to how you and I engage and love each other and love the culture and love the world we live in. 
Now, what most people will do with passages like these is they will spend most of the front end talking about how to do it and very little time talking about why we do it. And so this morning, what I hope to do is to spend most of our talking about most of our time talking about why we do it so that we can see how we do it. So it says that we are to love one another for love is from God. So, okay, let's take a step and just pause and look at chapter four. If you look at the word love in chapter four, every time that love is mentioned, it comes from the same root word in the Greek, and that word is agape. Um, for some of you in this room, you know exactly what that means, and you're going, yep, check it off. I know exactly where he's going with this. Some of this room are, in this room are going, I've never heard that before, and so let's spend a little bit of time talking about what agape love looks like. So I have a definition up on the screen that I want to work through with you, and this is what agape love is. It is the highest form of love. The love of God for man. Unconditional love, regardless of circumstances. Okay? So the highest form of love, it is a love that they would have understood as a love that starts and comes from God. It's not a love that you and I can conjure up on our own or create for ourselves. It has to come from God. It's a love of God for man. And it's unconditional, regardless of circumstances. So agape love, when every time you see the word love in the next chapter, in this chapter, and if you were to circle every time it says the word love, you would know that the root behind that word is agape. It is to love without any condition, okay? Now, this is different from the other types of love that you're going to see in the New Testament and Old Testament because essentially back in the day, uh, Greeks and Hebrews would have experienced or known that love finds itself in about three different ways, okay? One is um, this type of love that we get we call eros, okay? That it's this physical, intimate kind of love, okay? That husbands and wives experience, okay? And it's the word we get for erotic, okay? Which I don't want to talk anymore. My, my mom's in the room. So, okay, we're just, eros is that that love, all right? We're, okay, you got it. Okay. Then we have this philo or philos kind of love. This is brotherly love. This is this love we have for one another. We have each other's back. We're going to pace and walk and do life. All right, I got your back. Got my back. I'm here for you. And then we get to this third type of love, which is the highest form of love that they would have understood, this agape kind of love. And most of us have heard it said like that, that agape love is unconditional love. Now, what most of us say in that it's just unconditional love, most of us, it just kind of rolls off our lips. Okay, agape, agape love is unconditional love. It's just love, just, just no condition. But I wonder for us if, if we've really spent time thinking about what it truly means that under no circumstance and under no condition, God would completely love us with that kind of love because that is going to fuel the lens for the rest of what we talk about. That this love comes from God that you and I cannot make this type of love up, but it has to come from him. That I would love in such a way as having no condition behind it. I think about my friend uh, Chad Bullard, who used to be on staff with us in Odessa, and him and his wife Tamara uh, adopted a little girl from China, and they spent uh, years praying for, uh, for adoption. And all of a sudden, it happened just so quickly within a couple of months that, hey, there's a child for you and this sort of thing. Uh, Chad and Tamara did not go, okay, well, hold on a second. Let's talk. Is the baby come from a wealthy family? And they didn't step back and go, well, does, is, there any, is there any illnesses with the baby? Because, you know, we just, uh, we, want a, we want a really good one. We want a right baby. You know what? We don't want to, you know, some different. There was such an intensity and passion of no condition, no circumstance that they had towards this little girl that they flew to China to get her. And there are families like you in this room that have similar stories of that, that you went somewhere to get that child, and it didn't matter where the baby was from, what the situation they were in, 
you and your love and your heart went after that kid. So to even begin to understand this kind of unconditional love, we have to see first and foremost that in this agape love, God sees you and loves you without any condition. He doesn't see you and, and say to himself, wow, they, oof, my goodness, I knew they were bad, but this one is bad. Okay, no one, God is not looking at you and going, yeah, well, look, put him off to the side for a moment. We really need to re-examine that guy. Now, she's good. Here go. She's bad. That's all right. God looks at you through that lens and says, I love you. We have to understand that before we can even begin to apply that kind of love. In fact, it says this at the very end of verse 7. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. In fact, the very front of verse 8 says, the one who does not love does not know God. You see, for that word know, and I'm, getting, I'm hoping I get to, I'm getting too wordy with you, but even that word know here is a difference between knowing by fact and knowing by experience. And this word here is the word to know by experience. And I joked at the 9 o'clock hour, I said, you can know by fact that 2 plus 2 equals 4. $2 plus $2 equals $4. It doesn't affect you that you know that fact. But if you look in your bank account and see that there's $4, it affects you experientially. You go, oh my goodness, I have bills to pay, food to eat, and kids to take care of. Huh. And so there is a difference between experiencing four bucks in the bank account and knowing what four bucks is. Many of us know God by facts, and it hasn't changed us. Many of us have heard God preached up here. Many of us have been a part of Bible studies. Many of us even read our Bible, and we've heard by fact the truths in here and yet haven't experienced it. And there is a difference between knowing by fact and knowing by experience that you would understand that kind of love that only happens through experiencing the love of God. You don't get changed by facts. Knowing the sky is blue doesn't change anything about me. But knowing something that I will experience could change me. And it is by me experiencing that kind of love that I will even begin to understand what that kind of love looks like. In fact, this is... This is the form of love in verse 8. Let's keep kind of going on with this a little bit. Go to verse 8. Like I said earlier, the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, again, for some of us in this room, you're going, this isn't groundbreaking. I get that. That's awesome. Maybe it's a reminder to you of what love really is. But for some of us in this room, we've, this is the first time we're hearing this because maybe some of us grew up in a household or a church where God was not love. And you grew up with a dictatorial God that put his fist down and you were not loved. And I want to tell you that what you experienced was people, not who God is. You see, God tells us in his word that he is love. That in God, who he is, is the perfection and the embodiment of love. God is, in his nature, in his essence, what makes up God, part of him, this is not just an attribute, in his nature, he is love. He is that agape, unconditional, does not look at you through the lens of circumstance or condition kind of love. That kind of love is, in essence, in God. That is not just an attribute to God. Here's what I mean by that. I'm Jeff Turner. I have black hair. That's an attribute. It's something about me, okay? Um, something about you is something about you. But for God, it is in his nature who he is through which he does and lives and the activity that comes from him. So if you see this play out from beginning to end, everything about God and who he is is in the essence of his love. Justice is a part of his love. Discipline is a part of his love. 
Mercy is a part of his love. Compassion, grace, all of these things are a part of who he is in this love. In fact, we see the love of God played out even as as early as the beginning of creation in in the garden. He loved us. He, He created humans. Now, this is what is really interesting about this. God created humanity knowing full well that we were going to screw it up. Like, God made you knowing that you one day are going to break his law, tramp on his name, and blaspheme him, and mock him. In fact, as Christ followers, if we say we're without sin, we're a liar. That's what 1 John tells us. So there's going to be times, even as Christ followers, you're going to sin and mess up towards the Lord mock him, spit in his face because of what you do now, and yet you have God who still says, I love you. That, that, should, that makes no sense, that God would create a creature knowing full well that creature will spit in his face. That would be like me saying, I'm going to create something, but I know in three years from now it's going to punch me in the face. I'm going to create it, but I know in three years it's going to hit me hard. And I asked the 9 o'clock the same question. I said, would you create something knowing it's going to hurt you at your core in three years from now? Or three months, or three weeks, or three seconds? And yet God knew when he made me, when he made you, when he made the world, that out of his love and out of his joy, he was creating something with the fullest capacity to choose him or not choose him to love him or to disobey him. And yet God knew at the end of the day how much he loved us, that he would create us out of an overflow of his joy. That kind of love is a part of that agape love. Yet we still disobeyed and sinned against the Lord. God in his love poured out his love in creating you and me. That he would give us life. That he would give us a measure of joy here on this earth. And yet at the same time, we would look at him just like we did in the garden and essentially say this. God, I don't trust you. That is the antithesis of love. God, knowing what you're going to do, still loves you. And in our sin and disobedience, we say, I don't know that I can trust God's love towards me. This happened at the garden. This happens still now in our relationship with the Lord. It happens in our relationship outside of the Lord if we don't know the Lord. Essentially, we question our, and, and are suspect to what real love is. Because we've either been hurt or manipulated, trampled on by somebody, or we also think that something happened in life when God may have not been the one actually doing it, but we've attributed to him something that happened, and we said, I don't know if I can trust you, Lord, because I believe you're kind of holding out on me. This is, this is essentially what it is raising kids, for me to tell my son and daughter, hey, it'd be great if you did this. Uh, I don't know if I want to do that. Am, am I an idiot? Like, I've been here a little bit longer than you have. I love you. I'm trying to give something to you. God doesn't talk to us like this, only me, because I'm an awful person. And I'm just like, I love you. I want you to see this thing happen. And there's a little bit of suspect of even for a child to go, eh, I don't know. I don't know if I trust you. But in a deeper sense, this is what we see happen with relationships and marriages. That something inside of us goes, I just don't know if I can trust you. I'm holding out a little bit because I think you're holding out a little bit. I don't know that I can fully trust you because I don't know if you fully trust me. I've got this pain in my heart and and honestly, I'm going to love you, but I'm going to love you with a little bit of condition and hoping that you meet my needs. But if you don't meet my needs, it's done because I couldn't trust you. This is the pain we feel in relationships and marriages because for most of us, even though we say we have unconditional love towards our other person, down inside of that, when you dig a little deeper, there is actually conditions on all the love that we give other people. 
And it's the same thing that happens between our love, between our love and the Lord. I was talking with my wife, and I said, how would, how would you play this out? And we started talking about this reality that I chose Crystal, and she chose me. That I, I wanted her, and she wanted me. Nothing more, nothing less. And, and yeah, there's a lot of messiness in there. It's like all of us, none of us are perfect. And I, I said, every day, there's almost have to, has to be this reminder to you of me showing you my love towards you. Because I want you to know how much you love me. And I, I want to show you how much I love you, that I chose you. What most of us will miss out of this room today is how much God loves you and that he actually chose you. God chose you. You don't have to worry or wonder if you're his beloved. He sent his son. This is the next point we're going to get into. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. But that he sent his son to show you how much he loves you and how much he chose you. In fact, let's go ahead and do that. Go to verse 9. Verse John 4, verse 9. By this, the love of God was manifested in us. That God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. Verse 10. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You see, we get... with our sin and, and, and our inability to understand that kind of love because we always default to fear and manipulation, when God offers us his unconditional love, there's something in our heart that stops right there because we're suspect to it. and We wonder, does he really even love us? Which causes and chooses me to run in other ways that I think will give me that kind of love. And at the same time, God knew in order to show you how much he loved you and to redeem you back and show you that kind of love, he knew he was going to have to do that through his son Jesus. So he uses this word manifested. I want to talk about it just for a second. This word manifested, I want to give you a couple of definitions for this word. To make known, to make plain. I really love that. To just make it evident, simple. To make it plain, to reveal, to bring to light, to disclose or cause to be seen. So what God did was he revealed Jesus on this earth to show us and give us the fullest completion of what it means to have love, to be loved, and who the Father is. See, Hebrews chapter 1 says that God sent his son Jesus and that he was revealed as the Son of God, that he represented everything about who God the Father was. So God, knowing his people and knowing that they can't love him out of their heart because they're broken because of sin, God sends his son Jesus to show them what the love of the Father is. That Jesus is the perfect embodiment of love, that the fullness in Jesus is this agape love, that, that Jesus, when he interacted with people, showed the love of the Father. He showed it, like I talked about a couple weeks ago, with the blind man, that he could have said, hey, I, got, I don't have time for you. I've got to get on to more important things. He took time to heal his eyes, that he would talk with the woman at the well, that he would sit with the woman that is about to get stoned for her sins, that Jesus showed the fullness of that agape love while he was here on earth because he was the perfect representation of God the Father. You've got to know that because of the one whom you give your life to. And not only that, but it says that he came into the world and was sent to be the propitiation for our sins. That means to take on our sin and be the sacrifice for our sins. So it's crazy enough that I, when I was thinking about this creating a creature that I knew in three years would <laughs> do something wrong to me, and I'd go, I, if I knew that was going to happen, I'm not going to create it. But God knew that he was going to have to send his son for us. And it says that this is love. 
Guys, this is just causes us to pause and stop for just a moment to realize that what God is saying here is that at the center and heartbeat of agape love is God getting his son killed on our behalf. That at the cross, when Christ went there to pay for our sins and to tell us how much he loved us, that's not just an example of love. It's not just a picture of love. It's not just one of the many ways we describe love. For us as Christ followers, it is the apex. It is the central issue of love. Love in its fullness is found on the cross. So when we look and go, how much does God love me? God loved me so much that he chased after me with his son Jesus that he would get killed on my behalf because I could not enter into a love relationship with God because of my sin. And God went after me. And God loved me without any condition. And today, if you're in this room and there's something that keeps hindering you and going, I'm not sure God loves me. He doesn't know what I've done. Oh, he knows what you've done. He knows what you've done, and guess what? He goes, I love you all still the more. And some of us, this is our first time back in church in years, and you're wondering if I should have come back today. And I'm going to tell you this. If you don't hear anything else, I want you to hear that God loves you with a ferocious, passionate love that was only found in his son Jesus who died for you. That is the gospel message, and that is the picture of love. That is the apex of love, and that is the embodiment of agape love. That you and I didn't deserve it, but God came after us. That you and I can't conjure up that kind of love, but God put that kind of love in us through his son Jesus. When you give your life to him, you experience the newness of love. And you begin to experience that kind of love. And it is all in Christ, this picture, this apex, this central component of all that love is. And this is why we have to stop and look at that kind of love before we even start talking about how to live out that kind of love. That at the cross, Jesus gave his son. Excuse me, at the cross, God gave his son Jesus. And he said, I love you. I'm going after you. I'm redeeming you. I'm giving you a new life. I'm giving you new hope. I'm giving you a new heart. That kind of love is what John is getting at in 1 John. So for me to love one another is for me to have that kind of love and understand it so that as I love other people, I see them through the lens of the way God sees me. Listen, I, I know my own junk, and I'm sure you know your own junk as well. And there are times I stop and go, I'm not so sure that I really am that deserving of love. I'm pretty messed up. In fact, there are a lot of times I'm really stupid. I, I was laughing about this yesterday as we were coming off the loop, and I think I was talking to Crystal, and I was like, golly, I can't stand stupid people. She's like, yeah, me neither. Everyone's like, you know, honking at each other. It was just a reality that God continues to love me. That makes no sense. But in God, his precious creation, that is you. He put a son on the cross for you because of our sin and because of our brokenness. And God says, I gladly go after you. It's because of this love that we end on this last point. Our last piece of this whole thing today is knowing how well you are loved leads to loving well. Knowing how well you are loved leads to loving well. It changes the way, number one, how I look at myself. I, I don't know how you see yourself, but God sent his son for you. I don't know how you see your family or your spouse or your kids or, or et cetera. It changes the way I love and live well in that regard. It changes the way that I begin to see how I do life at business or my cubicle or at the office. And for God to come after me as an, I was an enemy of him. 
that in my sin I spit in his face and I continue to do things. Today I'm going to go home and probably do something stupid. Tomorrow, this week, I'm going to do something that's against his name and against his will. Sometimes I will look back and go, how in the world did I do that? And as I grow in the Lord, I grow in an understanding of how much he still loves me that draws me back to him. It changes the way that I begin to love other people. This is why it's so crucial that we talk about the why before we talk about the how. You have to understand how much Christ loved you before you can even begin to start in a journey of loving other people with that same kind of unconditional love. So as we leave today, my prayer for you is this, that you would know how much God loves you, that he would get his son killed on your behalf to take away your sin. Before the foundations of the earth, God knew the plan of salvation through his son Jesus, that you would begin to understand what real love is. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, this morning, You, you are the perfect picture embodiment of love. And not only did you show us how to love, but you loved us on the cross. God, this morning I pray that as we begin to understand what it is to regain that love that John talked about in Revelation chapter 2 that we would see how much you loved us. And it would change the way that we love you and love people. That you would change our hearts. And we invite you to do so. It's in your loving name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you guys. I had a great day with you. Have a wonderful day. Be blessed.